Good morning, everyone. Uh, Going to begin this meeting here uh, with uh, further look into the lines, and we're going to begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have each morning. And this morning, uh, we invite your Holy Spirit to teach and direct us, to correct all error, and to strengthen us for the trials of the day ahead. We are thankful, Lord, for each person that joins in these studies, those that watch online. And we just ask, Lord, that uh, as we continue to try to understand uh, these lines as they relate to our time, that you can help us to see things that will strengthen our, our faith and trust in you, that will guide our feet. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we uh, finished off yesterday, we had addressed the fact that we have these lines that... Um, um, we, we place the dates on these lines. So, so these, these were tentative. And we had dealt with Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And um, I'm going to address that again. And then the dates that we have, and we have to decide whether these are the best dates or not. Um, and, and I think in some ways we can refine these a little bit. Um, so when we looked at chapter three, and we just looked at this very cursorily, uh, in that we had looked at it in great detail previously, we had seen that these three judges were coming against um, uh, various enemies. The first one, of course, Othniel, is dealing with uh, the king of Mesopotamia, and we had looked at the name of what it means. So this double wickedness, and, and a Mesopotamia, of course, is means between the two rivers, and um, which is the Euphrates and the Tigris River. And there's going to be this eight years that they serve um, uh, this king, Cush, Cush, Cush and Rishathaim. Um, and then they're going to be delivered by Othniel, and he's going to represent the Holy Spirit. And um, he's going to provide the land rest for 40 years. And then we're going to have Ehud, who follows him. And this is going to be against Eglon, the king of Moab. So these are the Moabites. And um, they're going to be oppressed for 18 years. And then when they're delivered, and this was a long, complicated story that we looked into, um, which we're not going to look into at this time, but it's going to be uh, the land had rest for four score years, which is 80 years. And then we have Shamgar, who's mentioned. Uh, we don't have a period of time for Shamgar. Um, we had symbols there with Shamgar, 600 men he killed. He slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat. And one of the things we looked at, at Shamgar had to do with his, his name and the symbols here of uh, the various, well, the ox goat itself and 600. So when we looked at his name, it means a sword. And, of course, um, Anath is, means answer. So he answers with a sword against this enemy, which are the Philistines, which are going to be the enemy at the end in the story of Samson's, Samson. And, and we can see here that these some of these, uh, well, when we deal with Ehud, that's going to be over in uh, the east, right? Philistines are going to be in the west. And then when we looked at an ox goat, an ox goat, 
the word ox is related to plowing, and this goad has to do with teaching or instruction. So we can see that um, this answer of Shamgar is uh, to the response of the Philistines has to do with this methodical method of study, line upon line, and um, and also um, uh, this instruction with, with an ox goat. So we have all these symbols of instruction, the word of God, providing the answer, etc. So, uh, and also with the 600 men, six is an overplus, that is, there's five fingers on a hand, so six represents one more than that. Um, and this has to do with uh, understanding uh, time. And, and 100 itself uh, relates often to time as, as a mul multiplicative or a fraction. So, <clears throat> so such as a hundredfold, which would be multiplicative or hundredth being a fraction. So any thoughts on this first section? Because when we put this on a line, is what we did. We said that Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar relate to um, this period of time here between 9-11 and October 13th, 2018. And that this is, uh, this is the work that is being done by the Holy Spirit. So there's three different um, judges here in this period so has anyone thought about this a bit three judges three three angels three tests yeah so they're together as three so that would be like the first angel's message contains, you know, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So it prefigures all, all three messages. And we're going to have this then. Uh, we have 11.9 being the empowerment of the first message, right? And the story of Deborah and Barak, October 13th, 2018, is a formalization of the message. So, so we addressed uh, the idea of the close of probation, the parallel with Millerite history of the empowerment of the first angel's message. So 11.9 representing 9.11 and also representing August 11th, 1840 as the empowerment of the message. So when we start to look at this line here, this line here from the story of Judges directly is in we're making an application directly to our movement from 9-11 to January 11th, 2023. That's, that's what we have come to understand as we went through the book of Judges. But now we're placing each of these uh, judges on a line. Now, we're not, we're not placing the enemy there on the line, though in a sense we are, because there's an enemy, and an enemy is going to representing each of these reform lines that we see with each of these waymarks, they're going to represent a period of darkness, right? So, so they exist there, but we're focused upon the judges themselves, the messages that God is giving at this time and has been giving since 9-11 in response to the enemies that are left in the land. Now, the enemies that are left in the land um, initially by the church right that is seventh day adventism has not done its work in correct yeah. okay but this movement is a reform line that exists within adventism and our movement of course begins the whole movement begins in 1989 but we have uh in nine at 9-11, we have two different purposes for 9-11. It, it is the empowerment of the first angel's message 
on that bigger line. But in this line, it's a, the arrival of the first message. But we also know that it serves uh, um, a purpose as being the arrival of the second angel's message. And the thing that I've struggled with a little bit is understanding um, this line here that we have, these, this line from 9-11 to 2023, exactly what way mark this line is zoomed in onto. That makes sense. Because we know that there's this, this way mark of midnight. And the way that I understand this primarily is that this, this line relates to Samuel Snow in Millerite history. That is, Samuel Snow is going to give the second angel's message. But he's also going to have this prediction before midnight that is the second angel's message. It's just that once he develops that through these series of letters, it's going to be three days after his last letter that he then declares that it's midnight and gives the midnight cry. Now, that midnight cry is not going to be empowered until he gives it again at Exeter. But when he gives it at Boston on July 21st, he is giving the midnight cry. And um, so we know that midnight is coming. And so we can see that Samuel Snow's letters are, are addressing midnight. But we see that Samuel Snow's letters also are a zoom into a way mark. And, and I would think in some ways that the way mark that it's zoomed into is April 19th, 1844. And why would I say that? Why would I say Samuel Snow's letters are zoomed into that history? Even though he's predicting October 22nd, 1844, his letters themselves are going to be an expansion of the first day of the first month, that is the arrival of the second angel's message in his history. People understand what I'm asking. Well, a disappointment in the sense gave people open to his message. Previously to that, people weren't understanding or they weren't really taking on board his message. And so okay. after yeah. that disappointment, they, they were more willing to listen. Okay, so there is this, this disappointment, and, and that's how we mark, you know, the first day of the first month is this disappointment, uh, the end of Miller's prediction, and the arrival of the second angel. Now, of course, you know, you're correct. There is, just from a practical point of view, he's proclaiming, and he begins to do this with, his first letter that's written on February 16th, it's going to be published on February 22nd. Now, this is in a lesser publication, The Midnight Cry, um, which is published on, uh, it's going to be published on um, Thursdays, I believe, and, and The Signs of the Times published on Wednesdays, if I got that correct. Uh, they're Thursdays and Wednesdays. I, yeah, so yeah, so it's going to be published on because um, his second letter is going to be published on May 2nd. And the signs, he actually has an article in the signs on uh, May 1st, which we don't count because it's not, uh, it's not, it's not part of his prediction dealing with October 22nd. Though it does address the disappointment. But um, so we have this, this this fact that it's not going to be after till after the disappointment that his message is going to be understood but we can see that his message is the second angel's message and it's a zoom into the arrival of the second angel's message it's not zoomed into um you know, any of the other way marks. I mean, we could say, well, it, it could be a zoom into midnight itself, but it starts long before the first disappointment. 
Okay, what, what are other reasons we would say that it's a zoom into? These are a bit more complex. But remember, his second letter is the center of a chiasm, right? May 2nd. And what is May 2nd, 1844? No, it's not Pentecost. Pentecost is going to be Passover. Passover. Yeah, it's going to be Passover. Okay. Now, remember, his first letter was published on February 22nd, but it was going to be republished on April 3rd, which is a Passover as well, though the one that the Karaites and the rabbinic Jews observed in 1844. So they observed April 3rd, and that's going to be on the the former side of, you know, the first day of the first month, it's going to be on the left side in our lines. And then you're going to have the Passover, the true Passover over on the right side, right, the latter Passover. And you're going to have the first day of the first month in the center. So the thing about these Passovers is they show a separation of two classes, right? If you believe that the true Passover, that is, if you accept the chronology, that the true Passover is May 2nd, 1844. This means that you will have accepted um, the October 22, 1844 date as the 10th day of the seventh month. But if you have not accepted that, that is, that is, you didn't pass the test of um, the 1335, right? Then you will have been on the wrong side of that issue and the Passover to you would have been April 3rd. Does that make sense to people? So the center of that is the first day of the first month. So this becomes this dividing line um, in Millerite history. So there would have been those who were disappointed on March 21st, 1844. Would they have then again been disappointed on April 18th, 1844? No. no, because if you accepted March 21st, 1844 as the end of Miller's predictions, you would not have accepted uh, the understanding of the calendar that had occurred before that. That is, they already understood in 1843 um, that, that Miller's prediction ended on April 18th, 1844. Right? So they, this isn't something... See, well, we often have this impression. So there's a number of things that um, we have... not understood within Adventism. So we have this typical idea that um, 1843 passed, right? The Jewish year 1843 passed, and then they noticed their mistake of the zero year, for instance, correct? Is that how we commonly understand it? In Adventism? Yes, I think that's the general understanding. Yeah. Now, you know, and if you don't understand the history, I mean, you could take some of Ellen White's statements sort of to say that, but when you actually look at what she's saying and you know the history, you wouldn't read it that way. But yeah, so there's this idea that, you know, they're going along, um, they have the first disappointment, and, and we used to think that would be March 21st, and then... Uh, Samuel Snow is the one who notices that uh, we made a mistake, right? There, there is no zero year, and then they, they adjust the date um, to the fall because of that, right? Of course, that's not how it happens at all. 
So they had understood this back in 1843 already that, uh, and, and they would count like full years. So they would talk about the full, the full year. And, and there was a misunderstanding in our movement. When I came into the movement, they were talking about the fullness of the year mistake. Um, and I'm not sure who brought that in, whether that was Dwayne Dewey or I know Mark Bruce was promoting this idea. And um, when I started to point out to people that that wasn't really the case, it wasn't about the fullness of the year mistake. The problem was that there was no zero year. And, and I really had a hard time I'm understanding what people were saying about it because it didn't make any sense what they were trying to tell me. So I did a research on it and wrote a paper on it um, on the full year and the, the whatever it is. I can't remember what the paper's called, but it's in my site dealing with the full year. And, and so they had understood this prior to their disappointment. So that wasn't really the thing that caused their disappointment. It had to do with whether the prophetic periods ended in the spring or whether they ended in the fall. And so they believed that they ended in the spring of 1844. Samuel Snow had recognized this um, and decided on January 1st, 1844, that he was then going to uh, proclaim that Christ was coming back in the fall, not the spring. And so he began his work of study, wrote the paper, first paper. It's published on the 22nd of February, it's going to be republished April 3rd. So it's republished on this Passover. And then his second paper is published on the true Passover. And so these papers, uh, you know, become these, these tests, so to speak. Um, so when we look at Samuel Snow's letters, then we would have to say that they're zooming in They're They're addressing this, um, separation between those that are going to look at Miller's prophecies as ending in the spring of 1844 and those then that are going to come to accept that that it's going to be in the fall but it's also an understanding of the calendar so people who are dis disappointed because there were people who did not accept anything except it was from Miller so even though you had Joshua V Himes and others you know, pointing to April 18th as the last day for Miller's prediction to be fulfilled. There were some who were disappointed on March 21st, 1844. They weren't there. They weren't even looking for April 18th, 1844 as being the last day of Miller's prediction. So people already, and people had been falling away some at the beginning of the, the year 1843 on January 1st. Some even fell away on March 21st, 1843, so like the year before that. And some in the fall of 1843, after Miller's um, suggestion that Christ could come back in the fall types. So people were falling away from the movement as it progressed, um, and especially as they got closer to uh, the end of their prophetic periods. Um many people and, and the churches of course uh started opposing them so you know in 1842 so you're going to have the fact that they now have to have these independent camp meetings and they're going to build uh, the great tabernacle and all these things uh, because of the fact that they're no longer allowed into the churches so as they approach this date the ch churches that once supported them supported them because one is you're bringing in uh church members and of course money uh, to the coffers of these churches because of this this idea that Jesus is coming back. But uh, as they approach this date, for what whatever human psychology is involved in it, um, uh, the churches started to distance themselves from Miller and to begin to close the doors to the Millerites. So, so you have this progression of falling away. So if you had come to the end of the 1335, that is, you're, you're on April 19th, and you have accepted the calendar, and you believe you're in the tarrying time, so this is what was understood, they're now in the tarrying time, and but they're uncertain about what's going to happen. 
you're you're in the position where you could accept what Samuel Snow is presenting. So you will have passed the first test and you can then be benefited by the second. So, so if we understand that in Millerite history, we would have to say that this movement is primarily a zoom into 9-11 still. And, and what have we found with those who have fallen away in this movement, what is it that they ultimately end up rejecting regarding this movement? Do we see them still holding to 9-11 in the way that it was understood? No. no they don't, right? Um, <clears throat> now, why is that? Why, why are people rejecting 9-11, something that's so obviously true? Because it means that they would have to accept a waymark, and they don't like the waymark itself. They, want, they, they would prefer it not to exist. Yeah, so they're they're going to reject the lines and and specifically 9/11. That is, they're going to believe that that was a delusion. Pretty much that everything Jeff taught was a delusion, right? <clears throat> so they're going to abandon their position um, that they once held. So, um, I mean, people individually might hold on to smatterings of different things that they've learned. Um, but for the most part, it seems that people end up uh, just throwing out the whole kit and caboodle. So, uh, but particularly 9-11 ends up becoming a point of attack. Now, of course, they reject, reject July 18, 2020. But in order to do that, they have to reject all of the, all, all of the ways that we came to understand our lines in the first place. Okay, so, so that's something that I've been struggling with. And I think as we look at this, we can much more clearly see that um, uh, that arrival of the second angel in, in this line. So we look at this line, we can see that, you know, July 18th is this arrival of the second angel. But in a sense, we can bring this together. Can we, we take this way mark of these way marks and kind of move them together to see that these are all in a sense, an expansion of nine 11. That, that our line, what we've been experiencing has to do with, if we were to put it into Millerite history would have to be Samuel Snow's letters and would be an expansion of nine 11. So these way marks that we have here in this line, are an extension of what happened at 9-11. And so there is this passing of this test that has to do with the with this way mark, the arrival of the second angel, right? And in order to be benefited by the second, that, that is the arrival of the second angel's message at 9-11, we have to understand 9-11 because midnight is coming. And that's going to be Boston, right? Now, at Boston, we're actually making a proclamation. <clears throat> now, is our proclamation, is our message, um, attached to time? That is, are we going to be giving a time proclamation about something that's coming in the future on a definite time? Is we have time in this movement, but is our message a time message? No. Okay, so it won't be, right? That is, we're not going to be giving a proclamation. And Ellen White's really clear about that. That we're not going to be giving a time message. That's not the message to be given, right? Yet we're caught up in all of this time 
the, these lines that have very definite times on them. And this was a problem because if we believed that our line was actually going to be proclaiming the Sunday law, that is our line was about the Sunday law, then the Sunday law would have time attached to it. But we know that it doesn't. That is, we can't know the time of the Sunday law. And yet, when we looked at our lines, we had these things, for instance, the empowerment of the second angel here, Ibzad, Elon, and Abdon. December 25th, 2021, we marked as the Sunday law. And, of course, we knew it could not be the Sunday law, that it was symbolically the Sunday law. And, and now we understand that much more readily so um so there's still things that that we have to sort out but the one thing we can say is that our movement has had time that's really about this movement internally and the way that i looked at it back in uh, 2018 when we first had this and even before i saw that parminder was was a problem. I, I, I argued that the reason that we were in time, that is the reason we had time attached to our movement while we, why, why we were proclaiming time was because Parminder had started it. Right. With his time proclamation in 2012 and that we were now working out something that had been introduced into the movement by Parminder. And that, that it was going to be, it was more internal. That is, Parminder was seeing it as the Sunday law, you know, on the big line, Ellen White's line, that was going to come in 2014. But my argument was that it was something that was internal. Because 2014 was an internal event. It was all of these uh, ministries leaving and abandoning uh, Jeff. And so... It didn't make sense to me that we could be predicting external events because everything that had happened was internal. And so my argument was there may be external events, but it's primarily the internal events within the movement that we have time attached to them. If an external event is connected, it's not that we're proclaiming that event. And that's actually what ended up happening. External events occurred, not the external events that we predicted, but they were external events that witnessed to uh, our lines themselves. And we, we still continue to have that happen. Um, external events are connected to our lines. Now, any more thoughts on, on that, on those points? I'm going to look at uh, uh, I'm going to look at a line that uh, Stephen sent me. So I'm just going to save it so I can open it. Um, now this was rather interesting, and, and it relates to what we were talking about. Uh, yesterday. So I was talking about this 9 11 in 1989. And so you should be able to see that quite clearly. Um, so, Stephen, can you explain this line for us? If you're able to. Yeah. Um, okay. So I was listening to the presentation yesterday. And you highlighted an event that happened on May 25th in 2017. May 25th. And at that event, yes, 2017, um, there was a dedication going on at their time. There was two memorials set up in the new NATO headquarters that were based in Brussels. And Angela Merkel, she was uh, dedicating the memorial to the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. And they had a part of the Berlin Wall set up there. And then Donald Trump, he was um, 
dedicating the memorial to 9-11. And there was some girder from the Twin Towers there as part of yeah. that memorial. But there's also connected to Article 5. So Article 5 is part of the NATO um, treaty. So the NATO treaty occurred in Washington, D.C. on the 4th of April, uh, 1949. And, uh, and part of that, Article 5, was that if one country was attacked, all the other countries would be, in a sense, attacked as well. So if you attack Norway, you're basically attacking the United States. And that, mm -hmm. there, so that was part of that agreement. And that there was not invoked until the 4th of October 2001. Okay. When uh, 20, 23 days after uh, the Twin Towers fell on September 11th. Yeah. And uh, so that was part of that dedication as well. It was, that's, that's the only time that treaty has been invoked. Um, now, from that dedication, I noticed that it was 11,550 days, 11, sorry, 1,150 days to July 18. So uh, I just thought, thought, well, okay, that's interesting. That's half of 2,300 days. And uh, so I asked, I wondered, what, well, okay, where does another 1,150 days take me? And that took me to um, September 11th. Uh, this year, 2023. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting mm -hmm. as well. And that's uh, 20, 22 years since uh, 2001, um, which is also uh, two, 264 months. Okay, so 264 um, months, which is 22 years, 264 months, definitely significant. Now, those, of course, are Gregorian. Yes, had... <laughs> yes. And, of course, the dates there, uh, the 25th of May being a 525. And then on the Islamic, Islamic calendar, September 11th, 2023, is the 25th day of the second month, the 252. Yes. Right, so that gives us the 777. So pretty significant uh, observation there uh, regarding this. Um, now, I noticed that the number of weeks, uh, 1150 days is 164 and a quarter weeks. And when we looked at that uh, span of time from uh, October 13th, so that was noon on October 13th, 2018, and uh, September 7th at noon on uh, 2019. Uh, that was um, 329 days, and that was 164 and a half weeks to March 27th, 2019. So it's kind of a similar structure, this 2300 days relating to uh, 238 or yeah, 230 328 pardon me 328 and a half weeks which sort of relates to the uh, 329 days but but that's just a, a secondary observation so but here we have then this this chiastic structure um, that deals with July 18th at the center now um, so bringing this up, one is we see all of these symbols. We see 1989 and 9-11, uh, this, this Article 5 that's invoked 23 days after September 11th. So how does this relate to our understanding of our history from September 11th to 2023? So what we're talking about right now when we're dealing with the story of judges. 
I mean, there's lots here, right? I mean, maybe it's too much to even think about. But we know we have the 2300 months from the first day of the first month in 1844 to April 5th, 2030. And with that April 5th, 2030 date, we are, to, we are able to establish from the book of Ezra, from Ezra 7 to 10, we are able to establish the chronological connection between September 11th, 2001 and Millerite history. That is, our history um, is, is an echo, let's say, of the 2300 days. So our history that we're experiencing in this movement is a parallel to Samuel Snow. Does that make sense? That, that this is just more witnesses of this. And of course, we have the 264 months, the 26th day of the fourth month on the Islamic calendar, right? And that's why we can use the Islamic calendar because this is about, um, obviously, September 11th, 2001 is Islam. Now, does it mean we're predicting anything on September yes, 2023? What's that? Stephen? Yeah, so I'm just saying, yeah, so significant in this year is the dates, so 2017 and 2023. Um, so you have uh, if, you if you take the 17 and 23 and multiply them, you have 391. And then you have 2020 there as well, just with that, just with end date. Okay, so you're saying if you take from 2017, you take 17 and you multiply it by 23, you get the 391, yes. right? So, so, and that's the number dealing with Islam, right? 391 years. So you take the dedication of the Berlin Wall in 2017, and you take this date, 2023, and you just multiply 17 times 23, you get 391. So that- Also, that, from yeah. when the treaty- just another point to notice that from when the treaty was uh, signed in 1949 to okay. when the, the Ar Article 5 was invoked, it's uh, 63 months, 630 months. Just so you have like a half of a well, 60 there. Okay, so it's what? what's the date? It's in. 1949. It's the uh, fourth. Yes, it was signed on the fourth of April. Oh yeah, April fourth. That's right. Um, so you're gonna get April fourth, 1949, and then it's invoked. So that's the and date it's invoked, which is October fourth. Right. Uh, in 2001. Okay. So. Yes. Yeah, so that ends up being, yeah, 52 years and six months. Um, so, which is kind of interesting. We have the 52 there. Um, so 52 times 12 is 264. So you, you're counting... Um, So it's 200, 630, right? So 264 plus 6 is 630. Okay, so that's interesting. So, so we can see all of these symbols in here. They relate to all of the things that we're talking about, 630. Um, 63, we know that that's half of uh, 126, so 630 is half of 1260.
And any other points? Uh, there's, I think, something in the chat. Okay, just dealing with the 22 years as being a symbol of restoration. Okay. So, so when we look at, at these first three judges, again, so we go to these first three judges, um, I'm saying that they bring us to Oct October uh, 13th, 2018. Now, why do I say that? I mean, they, they, they precede that. Because we're going to take the second one, we're going to take the second way mark as being Deborah and Barack. And um, this is, remember, we have Cicero representing the message of Parminder. So, so we went through this in quite, de quite a bit in detail. So why did I take this story and put it as October 13th, 2018? Anybody remember? So what is the message of Parminder? So we have Sisera here. So we have Javan, the king of Canaan, right? And we have Sisera, who is the captain of the host, the army. Now, we could have, so if we, if we look at the charts, I'm going to go back here. I mean, we could have just simply put 11.9 uh, here as the formalization of the message, right? So I could have moved this over to here. Could have done that. Could have had some other date here. It was the empowerment to this message. There's other ways it could have been done. We could have put um, different dates here. We could have even put. Um, um, we could have done this. So I'm going to just change this a bit. Um, oops. So I'll do it this way. Um, Okay, so what's this date? The 9-6 of 2019, you mean? Yeah, um, should be 9-7, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> when, isn't that when Jeff came out of retirement? Right, now, if I put in here, uh, um, so it's September, so we're going to put uh, – 
this. What I've done is I put both these dates. Uh, this is this is noon, right? This is the calculation of the 391 day, 391 and a half days from noon, October 13th, 2018, to noon on November 9th, 2000, or not, not to noon, but to the beginning, to midnight commencing. Uh, November 9th, 2019, right? So I did this calculation at noon and it brought me to the beginning of November 9th. But I also, at noon, I'm going to do this calculation watching Jeff's presentation, not in person, because here I'm at Lambert Church and here Jeff is going to do his last presentation at Lambert Church. I'm going to be in Warburg and uh, watching on my phone instead of listening to the sermon uh, in Warburg. And um, I'm going to do this calculation on a piece of paper um, and I figure out how, how long it is. And um, I find that March 27th, 2019 is the center of a chiasm. But I also see the significance that this is nine times seven is 63 and this is 63 days to november 9th so so i start to see the first part of that chiasm that jeff's going to eventually do when he gives us january 11th uh, 2020 and of course, that January 11th, 2020 speaks to January 11th, 2023 as well. It being a bone day, right? It's being a, a self-same day. So could I just put both those dates there together? That would be possible. So, so both of them sort of speak to the same thing. They're part of the same structure. And this is going to be this. Um, so what ends up happening on October 13th is I'm giving a confirmation for Tess's prediction of November 9th. But I'm giving it a true witness. That is, they tried to mix truth and error, Satan did, by having them proclaim November 9th. But they're actually proclaiming something quite different, like there's completely different principles involved in the time setting that Tess is using, uh, compared to the observation that I make about time. Right? So, so Tess and Parminder want to be able to predict an event. But I'm simply confirming a date. Correct? That is, I'm noticing a structure on both of these dates, but I'm not predicting an event. Also, my basis for understanding time is not dispensational. That is, I'm not taking Ellen White statements regarding time setting and saying Ellen White's in a different dispensation, so now we can set time. And this, of course, is a fundamental difference because uh, this dispensational argument allows them to reject whatever they want to in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, where I believe that we have to be founded upon uh, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, that we can't contradict in inspiration and that Ellen White's statements regarding time setting still stand. That was my position. And that whatever we're predicting with these dates, whatever we're doing with time, it can't be a contradiction of what Ellen White is saying. And so it must be internal, right? So when I look at 9-11, I see it simply as a date in where there's going to be a separation in the movement. 
And I don't join in the idea that this is going to have something to do with Islam specifically or Russia and the United States or anything like that. So I actually don't take that position. I'm not looking for anything to happen between the United States and the, and Russia, which this is primarily what Tess is doing. I do note, however, that, that I believe that she was correct in taking these various dates in the past that are connected with 9-11 and seeing this pattern of 9-11s, such as, you know, the night of broken glass and, and even, uh, the, the date there um, in the French Revolutionary calendar that is July 27th on our calendar, but is 11-9 on the French calendar. Uh, because one is I start to see that there's these, that these relate to something that I'd already understood, and these relate to the symbols having to do with the connection between the book of Ezekiel and also um, Revel Josiah Lich's understanding of Revelation 9, his prediction regarding August 11th, 1840. So, so here, on October 13th, 2018, even though it seems like I'm in agreement with Tess, and even Parminder sort of sees it as a witness to what Tess is doing, fundamentally, what I am doing is at odds with what Parminder and Tess are doing. So if we're going to look at this, this battle between Deborah and Barak and Sisera, so you've got Sisera and Deborah and Barak are going to have this conflict. Um, and remember, Barak, he won't go to battle unless Deborah comes with him. And Deborah is who in, in our understanding of that story? Doesn't Deborah represent FFA as a church? Yes. So what, yeah. So that's what we understood. And this message of Barak is going to be the message of July 18th. Right? Which is connected to what he what that what I did, you know, back on October 13th. Even though I started to I gave the 391.5 in support of November. November 9th, I also saw that we had these connections with the prophecy of Josiah Litch and the prophecy of Ezekiel. Both of them give us 391.5. And then from that, when I delved into them deeper, I found that we had a July 18, 2020 date that was 252 days after November 9th. Now, by the time that came about, Parminder had talked with Tess and Tess didn't want to have anything to do with my 391.5 supporting her November 9th because she's the prophet of the movement. All light has to come from her. And um, definitely they rejected July 18, 2020. So, so we had this whole uh, conflict going on within the movement. But I did not move ahead with July 18th without the support of FFA. So when the, the movement put a stop to July 28th or July 18, 2020, I no longer promoted that, that message. I studied it, you know, along with Odilio and Stephen, um, but I was not promoting it in any way. And, um, and then what we ended up having happen was uh, on August 29th, you're going to have in, in 2019, Stephen and Adilio and John Mark are going to be brought to before the uh, papal tribunal and uh, they're going to be anathematized, right? And of course, me in absence, right? That's going to happen. And then we're going to have uh, September 7th, 2019 occur. And that's going to address this Deborah and Barack issue. And, and then we're going to have finally the separation on 
And that's going to be the story, story of Gideon. So Gideon's going to be a zoom into, um, on this judge's line, a zoom into our history of 11.9 itself. And we saw that, right? So hopefully people remember enough of these things that we can see how these are fitting together. You know, I don't know how much we have to go over it, whether we just watch the videos we did before, which is a lot of them, uh, or we just go over it ourselves individually and establish this. Now, the thing that we can see when, when we zoom in, let's say we take uh, the line of Gideon. So Gideon is, is a judge. He has a line. And that line is going to include way marks that we see on the bigger line of the judges, but they're going to serve a different purpose, correct? People understand what I'm saying? Because each of these judges are going to, in some way, connect us to 9-11 and, you know, once we get to Gideon, um, and also to January 11th, 2023. Is that what we saw when we went through the book of Judges? Now, Deborah and Brack don't bring us to 2023. Uh, specifically, though they do hint at it. Othniel and Ehud don't bring us to 2023 specifically. But they're going to definitely address 9-11. And, and they're also, you know, Deborah and Brack are going to address July 18th. So what we can see with these lines is they, they connect us to these different histories. For instance, in Deborah and Barak, um, we have what are the two tribes that are going to join Barak? Zebulon and Naphtali. Okay, we have Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, what was the importance that we saw in Zebulun and Naphtali? So, um, so Zebulun, for instance, uh, who used this, the numbering of the tribe of Zem Zebulun, uh, as a significant um, number? Who first did this? At the time, we were actually in the book of Judges, uh, or not Judges, uh, Joshua, looking at... Um, the numbering is of the tribes. Yeah, that Adilio. So Adilio is going to do something with Zebulun. And what is he going to do? Well, uh, one of the numbers lined up with the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in July 18, 2020. Yeah, so something quite significant here in, I'll just... Yeah, so you're going to see this connection, uh, the organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the General Conference in 1863, May 23rd. And it's going to be the numbering of the tribe of Zebulun. Um, in, uh, num that's going to actually be in uh, Numbers um, numbers 2, I believe. That Zebulun is going to be counted as 57,400 days. Well, people, but we're going to take it as days, and that's going to lead us to July 18, 2020. Now, um, there was a whole bunch of things dealing with this, but, uh, you know, I looked at Naphtali, and Naphtali is numbered as 53,400 of the tribe of Naphtali, of men of war. And I take that as days. And this is a study that he did dealing with the signs, harbingers, and tokens. Um, so 
right? So this is basically Odilio's study that he did later, um, not his first study where he dealt with the, the mandates, but this is the one that he dealt with these signs. And um, so he's, he's gonna find these spans of time and the significance of them. Um, but I'm going to connect this uh, with our history. And one of the ways that I do it is I go back to this event, which is the falling of the stars, November 13th, 1833. And I'm going to connect it with Naphtali. And it's 1780 prophetic months to January 27th, 1980. Um, that's going to be 10 days before uh, my 17th birthday, I believe. And then it's going to be 187 days to August 11th, 1980, in which I'm baptized. Um, not baptized. Um, that's going to be when I'm converted. And that's going to be during the falling of the stars, the Perseid meteor shower. So this connects it to that year. And then um, it's going to be the number of days that the manna from when it first fell to the day it last fell is 14,587 days. That's 100 and, uh that's 14400 days plus 187 days and that's going to be to July 18 2020 so so we could connect that plus um, when we take of uh, the tribe of Reuben which is 46500 days and we we go to the date that Parminder used well, he didn't use the specific date, but he used the general conference in 1888 to count uh, um, to 2014 using the 126 years. And so if we count from there using the tribe of Reuben, we're going to get to Parminder's ordination on February 27th, 2016. So, so we were using the numbering of the tribes. And, and so we can see that Zebulun and Naphtali, become witnesses about the truthfulness of July 18 and also connect, well, me personally to the proclamation of July 18. And it's going to be the work that, that I do um, in connection with that history. That's going to be the answer to, so that's the Shamgar answer uh, to um, what's happening here. Does that make sense to people? I know it's rather roundabout. But that's why I'm saying that Deborah and Barak, the answer to Deborah and Barak, or the answer to Sisera is Deborah and Barak, that, those messages. And that's gonna be FFA proclaiming July 18, 2020. And, and this is going to be because of the work of Barak, which is in relation to chronology, to the counting or measuring of time. Right. So that's that's what's going to happen in relationship to how how Parminder is dealt with. So when we get to the story of Gideon, we're going to see a lot of the same things. That is a lot of the same symbols. Uh, but, but there's a shift away from this emphasis here on the formalization of the message, that is understanding how to produce time. And in the story of Gideon, what is the issue there? So what is the story of Gideon about? We're not going to get that finished today, but start on that. So remember, the Midianite oppressors. So what was Gideon about? What, what is the enemy that has to be conquered with November 9th, with that line? Because November 9th marks the separation between two classes, right? It becomes a close of probation in the movement. For the, Correct. Yeah, okay. And we know that the Midianites, Midian refers to strife, 
right? We look up median, it means strife. And we're saying that, that there's a strife in the movement that, that has continued. And this is a residual from what has happened with Parminder. That is, even though many people in the movement had rejected Parminder's message, they were still infected with Parminder's message, especially in the aspect of secrecy, secret meetings, talk gossip, rumors, innuendo, right? All of these types of things. And so, so that's attached to November 9th, where we have this separation. And so when we went through this story of Gideon, we're going to see one is we have the proclamation of July 18th attached to it, correct? Because Jeff attached the Gideon to the proclamation of July 18th. And we accept his attachment of that, the 300. I think we would have to. Yeah. Yeah. So we see that the 300 are those that are left. That's the way that Jeff looked at it. Once Parminder's movement separated, we had 300 left. So there's this process of separation that occurs um, in, in the story of Gideon. But there's also uh, all this issue about Gideon's call. That is, we know that there was um, a, a prophet that had given this message. So we're saying that's representing Jeff, Jeff's message, right? That's verse 8. So, so isn't this, uh, yeah. as, you're, as you're making the application with Gideon and the 300, yeah. do we also not include... Miller and the 300. Yes. So that's the parallel, right? So we have the 300 charts. Those are made before um, the first, first disappointment, right? Correct. And, and those 300 charts survive, don't they? Definitely. Because <laughs> now, you know, eventually a lot of them disappear, but I mean, the Millerite preachers were using those charts all the way up to um, the end of Miller's prophetic periods. And, they, and then they see that there was this tarrying time that's on the charts, well, because of Habakkuk 2, verse 1 to 5. 1 to 5 or 1 to 4. Um, and uh, so that is true here in, in our history that there is this message that goes before. So there's a separating process that occurs in Millerite history. They go from 500,000 down in, in that first message to 50,000, but ultimately they go to 50 at the end. So we're gonna see that happen with, with this message. But here we have the 300 as the symbol in, in the call of Gideon, in the separation that later happens. But looking here at the call of Gideon himself, we can see that this is based upon a prophet who is given a message, right? So the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hands all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose hand ye dwell, whose land ye dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Now, um, so it doesn't really tell us much about who this prophet is. I mean, it just mentions that there was a prophet. Um, and it's not much different than what Moses had said. So he's in some ways repeating the message of Moses. Uh, we do know that in Judges 2, verse 1 to 3, it says the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. 
So we can see that this message of Gideon is relating to the message that we had looked at earlier. And, and when we looked at um, Judges 2, 1 to 3, we saw that this had to do with um, uh, the start there is 9-11, right? So that's the mighty angel coming down at 9-11. And so if we're going to parallel this, we can see that this is relating to the message that Jeff has about 9-11. You know, I mean, there's a lot more detail that can be done there, but we're going to say that this prophet is, is Jeff's message, right, regarding 9-11. So it's not just stuff dealing coming up to 9-11. It has to do after 9-11. Does that make sense? I would say that it's logical. Okay. So then Gideon is called. Now, so Gideon is another message. But this call of Gideon, you know, in, in placing it, we're placing it at November 9th, right, 11-9 in 2019. So we're, we're placing it in that history. That is, Gideon is a zoom into that history. Of course, it touches back to 9-11, because 11 9 and 9-11 are connected together, being a mirror of each other. And, um, and then the issue is going to be here, uh, this worship that is going on. So, so we, we looked at this in detail, and we're going to see then uh, these offerings that are going to be made. And how did we address this offering? Do you remember? So there's going to be the first offering, the unleavened cakes and uh, the flesh and the broth. Remember, Gideon's going to say, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Now, so they're in oppression of the Midianites. Gideon, uh, he knows about this message of the prophet. An angel of the Lord comes to him under the oak, which was at Oprah. Right, he's going to be uh, threshing wheat by the wine press. And so we spent a lot of time on this. So how did we apply this? Can somebody give us a summary of this? We know they're going to be worshiping the altar of Baal. Right, with this grove. Gideon's going to destroy this altar. So what is this message specifically? Does anybody remember what we studied in Gideon? Yeah, some. I mean, he's threshing wheat, so he's going going through through God's word, right? And an angel comes down. Well, that happened at 9-11. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, so it's, it's mainly confronting. Yeah, it's mainly a confrontation and a bringing down of lies, of false, false doctrines and worship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so it's attacking a message, which is the message of strife. So that's the conflict that exists within the movement. 
We're going to have the signs of the fleece. How did we address those? Okay. And then, um, and then in the story of Gideon, we're going to deal with the 300 men itself, which we're going to, we're going to connect to the July 18, 2020 proclamation. Right. So, so that's the way that we address that in, in the story. So we're going to have these connections to 9-11. We're going to have these fleece that are put, put out and understand what those are. And um, so when we look at Gideon, we can see that this is connecting to this history. But he's going to have all of these way marks, right? Uh, he's going to go to July 18th because that's going to be the proclamation of July 18th. And then we're going to have, um, you know, this uh, story, Tola and Jair, and see how that relates. Then we're going to have uh, Jephthah, right? So, so we're going to have all this history here, and, and we, we, we have to establish that this fits the way that we're showing it. That each one of these judges is aligned and contains these other waymarks. Now, what we need to do more specifically then, and because we can look at these in a general sense, but we need to have a line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Now, I would say this is the first, second, and third angel's message, right? So if we're going to draw a line, this line, we're going to have a line called the line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And that line we're going to have drawn out just like this. Right, so that's what we want to be able to do. And then we're going to do the same with Deborah and Barak. We're going to be able to take this way mark and draw a line just like this. We do the same with Gideon. We draw a line just like this. Now, there'll be different dates in those lines. That is, each of these lines may share some of the same way marks with other lines, but they're going to have their own specific way marks. Because I don't think we can just deal with them in these general senses. But you can see, as we look at each of these, these judges, we have some lots of detail. And the only way that we're going to, one is the only way we're going to remember it, uh, is if we can place these things in a way uh, that we can draw them out like this. Is this what we need to do? Um, yes, because it makes it clearer for us. Okay, makes it clearer. Now, I mean, we could say, well, we understand this line well enough. Um, you know, let's move on, go on to something else. But can we see that this line directly relates to us at the pre present time? And that we need to understand it in detail. Because what, what I believe that we're working to, so so we are planning to have a camp meeting here in my building um, on uh, the, the end of July, beginning of August somewhere. I don't have the exact dates. And, and of course, we're going to put that up on YouTube. Um, the meetings, we're going to uh, probably do it as a Zoom studies. But what I believe that we're going to be doing is we're going to be presenting this history of the judges that directly relates to our movement. And this is what we need to understand at the present time. And so in July or August, uh, when we have this camp meeting, we definitely have to have these lines sorted out. So we have we have work to do before for us to do. And and that's what I'm going to be presenting. Now, I'm asking Stephen, he's going to be here, um, Lord willing, and he's going to present a lot more of the chronology of the judges itself. So in a lot more detail than what he has presented and a bit more simply, a bit more slowly. The idea is that we would have uh, uh, six 
presentations um, that Stephen would do. Um, you know, and I, I probably have to do maybe six or seven or something like that to get through this whole line of the judges. But that's what we want to present to this movement. We want to have a paper written. So I need to write a paper on this. I need to have all of the lines uh, drawn out. And I mean, to me, that that is going to say a lot to people in the movement if we can do that. It's a lot of work, uh, even though you could say I have, you know, like six months or so uh, to get that done. It's that's actually a pretty short time for what I want to get accomplished. But if we start to go through these things in in drawing out those lines, I mean, we're going to see a lot of things that we don't see right now, right? We know that that's the case. But the, the first thing that we have to do and try to establish is, is this line that we have in front of us reasonable? And, and maybe if we start looking in more detail, we might adjust some of these things. But from what I can see, it, it seems to be reasonable. Both in the judges, how they're laid out below, and, and, and in the dates themselves, though even though they can... Uh, we're zooming into a date as a way mark, we can say that that obviously expands out once we zoom into it. Any further thoughts before we close with prayer about any of this? Uh, the camp meeting, what we see in front of us. Yeah, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the camp meeting. I'm just praying that somebody will be able to bring me. Otherwise, I'd probably just stick up my thumb. But I was looking at the at the uh, the 1150 days, and I was thinking 511, one, and then I thought 151, that would bring us to the shekels in, in Daniel 5. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Um, there was something, uh, well, it's also the 15th day of the first month. So, so that's another symbol that we have. Okay. So, I mean, we'll come back to this tomorrow. We'll, we'll start tackling this. Um, I still think we want to look over this whole line. Um, and then we'll start dealing with Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar and place them on their own line. So that would kind of be a goal um, this week. And, you know, and I roughly think that it's going to take us, you know, maybe a week for each of these judges to place them on a line plus some extra time as well. So I don't think it's, it's that easy. Because we're going to get into lots of detail. I, I know that we're going to have these little uh, side studies that, that address these things in, in detail especially some of the chronological information. Okay, so let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for all that you have done and for what you are doing. And we ask for your continued uh, care and leading in our lives. We see our frailties and our need of you. And we just ask that um, you can be with each person. Those that are searching for truth that you want to lead uh, to these studies, we pray that you can do that. And that you can help us to be faithful in our personal study and prayer life. And also, Lord, in, um, in um, the personal interaction with others that we can reflect your character. Be with us now and keep us and bring us together again according to thy will. We pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.